all of that. This goes slowly and surely. These will all fill in nicely. All right, this is gonna be a big moment. Prompt to boot. This Samsung Galaxy S10 came in for data recovery. Originally, it was boot looping for the customer, but I believe another repair shop destroyed the phone and it is now just current looping. This is not a good behavior on a DC power supply. Most likely what they did is they used too much heat on the board and floated the CPU. A lot of these shields were already removed and I don't know what they were trying, but it is now not in a good situation. So the ultimate solution here is just to do a CPU swap. This is where we swap the CPU and the UFS to a working donor board. This is a board I already have prepped that I've used several times for these jobs. And this is a fully working S10 housing. So I have purchased these for the purposes of these data recovery jobs. So we're gonna do this in this video. It's gonna be really long, but I'm gonna show you guys the full process on how to do these successfully. Now I don't recommend you try this at home because it is a very really skilled job. And if you mess up these chips, the data is gone forever. So don't attempt this if you have zero experience. You should practice this several times and be able to do this on practice boards multiple times successfully before you even try it on a customer's board. So if you guys need your data recovered, send me a message. My website is right there in the bottom of the screen and we can help you with this service. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is what the board looks like right now. Uh, the shield is removed. There's like, so I think what they did is they glued the sticker that goes here back onto the board. And you can see there's a lot of like scorched marks here. Also this chip right here is cracked. Probably when they try to lift it, they damaged it as well. Here's the CPU. It's actually a two layer chip. So there's a CPU underneath and the RAM. The RAM is technically not paired. You can replace it if it gets damaged, but the CPU below it is, is paired and the UFS chip that's under here. Also this shield is also removed and it kind of looks like it's been broken off. So I don't, I don't know what happened at the other shop. I don't have that story. Uh, this was just sent to me as is for data recovery. So uh, the original symptom was that it was boot looping. Typically that is a CPU issue, but uh, a lot of technicians don't know how to handle those and then they'll destroy them and make them worse. All right, so let's first uh, get rid of the shield up here. So if you need your data recovered, uh, you want to make sure you go to someone reputable, someone that has experience working on these. There's a lot of shops who love to experiment on customers' uh, phones and or they don't know their limits. Uh, I think that's the main thing is they don't understand the risk. Uh, there's a lot of people who just start soldering. So they try to take on every job because they are excited to try soldering, but they have no idea how to diagnose things properly. So they'll just do a bunch of uh, random things and ultimately end up uh, with the phone in a worse state. So when it uh, when a job is recoverable and some inexperienced tech gets their hands on it, you've now made it 10 times harder because now we gotta fix whatever the last tech did plus fix the original issue. In many cases, uh, there's just so much going on that it's just more practical to do a CPU swap. This is what, we, what we're doing in today's video. So I'm gonna make uh, the shield removal easier by adding some super low melt solder. This is 138 Celsius solder wire. It allows us to uh, decrease the melting point of the solder that's on here. The factory solder is about 222 or 223 or something like that. And it makes it really hard to desolder stuff. Basically the same temperature you need to melt everything else uh, will be that factory solder. So if we add low melts, we basically lower the temperature of this solder joints, but not everything else. And let's try using the standard 380 uh, setting. See how far we can get into this. And while it's hot, it's easier to also apply some more or spread out that solder that we installed. Oh man, this stinks. There's this glue here that was holding down the like the little foam thing that goes here. Oh man. By the way, if you like uh, these videos, make sure you guys are checking out the links in the video description. Uh, I'll have my new t-shirts 
Uh, there, the shiny solder balls, which is the shirt I'm wearing right now. This is the my latest design, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, get yourself one if you want to see more videos like this. It helps fund uh, these videos, the creation of these videos. Helps me pay for better cameras, microphones, and lights and all that. All right, so what I like to do is first wick this flat. And then I shave down a spatula tool and so this is my, this is the customer's chips. So these are the ones we have to save. We don't want to damage these and we are going to check the health of this UFS chip. This is the memory, this is the storage, this is like the hard drive of the phone. This is where all the data gets written into, but it's encrypted, meaning the data jumbled. The only way to unjumble it to make the data readable is through encryption keys that are in the CPU. So they're paired together to for security purposes, but it also makes it uh, difficult for data recovery. So it's good for security, but bad for data recovery. So, I am slicing through, there it goes, chips off. All right, no rip pads that I can see, at least right now. You know what, uh, while it's still hot, let's remove the CPU and RAM as well. It's already here. It's funny because I had to do two of these last week, back to back basically. Not literally back to back, but within like two days of each other. Now this is my third one in less than, I would say less than seven days possibly. All right, so the trick here is we got to lift the RAM chip first. So we got to slice through it. I'm going to use the same temperatures, 380 and 50% air. Now one thing uh, a lot of people ask, like, what temperatures? These are specific to my hot air station. This is not calibrated. So my 380 is gonna be different than yours. I'm also using the largest uh, bent nozzle there is for this hot air station, the add-in. It makes uh, applying heat more widely easier. It's perfect for CPU swaps. All right, chip is off. Now I gotta save this one just because I don't have a spare right now. And this is a CPU. So now we gotta prep this CPU while we have it here. And I'm also gonna use a low melt here. This makes it easier to prep. All right, so you just wanna get solder on all the pads. Now there is a uh, underfill here. This is like some clear glue that's designed to hold stuff together. Uh, my understanding is meant for shock absorption, but I don't know. I'm not a mechanical engineer, whatever job title it is for that decision. So we gotta use our soldering iron to try to clean that up. Now I am using a knife tip on my action uh, soldering iron station. T210 handle with the JVC knife tip. I will link to all my tools in the video description as well if you want to pick up any of these tools. If you use the links I provide, they typically are affiliate links, so I do make a small commission out of each purchase through that link. That's another way you can support the channel and it costs nothing extra to you. So make sure you guys are checking those out. And then this is uh, my favorite wick I've ever used in my many years of soldering. It's a Chemwick wick. And it works beautifully. As you can see. 
I mean, it also requires a uh, good technique. You can't, uh, it's not always the tools, it's also uh, the technician. All right, so let me, uh, by the way, I'm trying to do this as fast as possible. Um, starting to really hate making these long videos, as you've probably heard me complain in other videos, but um, I, I also do like to show every step so you can see what it takes to do these jobs. And, and it's also, uh, some people are skeptical about some of these videos, like, oh, is it truly, um, are you truly doing what you're showing in the video? Uh, whenever I do shorts, you know, I cut, it's quick clips of the repair, the full process, and if you're not paying attention, it'll look like I maybe uh, skip some steps. Like one common one I've seen a lot where people are, are doubting what I, my work is I, I remove a chip that's water damaged and then in the process of cleaning it, I'm rotating the board, which I do show in the video, but since they're, they're not, I'm guessing they're not technicians, uh, they, they don't realize I, re I rotated the board and then I install the chip now the other way, the other direction because the board is flipped, but people are like, wait, you install the chip backwards and essentially saying like, oh, you're faking, you're faking it because why else would I install a chip backwards and then show it working at the end, All right? So showing you every step, uh, just kind of help prove that this is a real job. It's not just uh, me staging everything for YouTube. Yeah, I typically don't tell customers uh, which video of mine is their device because it's kind of irrelevant. Also, so I don't have any way to prove like, hey, customer, like, can you tell these uh, people, these uh, skeptics that I really did fix your phone? All right, so lifting a CPU requires a lot of patience and hand skill. You're, so what I'm doing is I'm inserting my tool and trying to slice through the underfill. I'm not trying to bend the chip up. This is uh, how you could damage the chip itself. So I'm just trying to slice through the underfill. Uh, the high temperatures also help soften. Oh, there it goes, soft. All right, looks good to me. So let's go ahead and prep this. All right, this this process is very messy. So you're gonna burn through a lot of uh, a lot of cleaning cloths, but it's just part of the job. So you know, one of the costs to this service is these specialized cleaning cloths that I have. Now these specific ones, I bought a stack when I first started. There was like a thousand of them and I can't find the exact ones anymore. <laughs> so I don't know. I bought several with the same description and the original listing, it's uh, no longer available. So using the same description, I try to find other ones, I bought them and they're not the same. So I don't know where to find replacements of these specific cleaning cloths. The first step is to flux everything. Next step is to add low melt. This is a low melt solder paste. This is the same one I use for reballing sandwiches. I uh, just happen to have some already here uh, for a sandwich for bottom or swap I did actually yesterday. The goal is to get solder on every single pad. Let's do this so I don't warp my paper towel. So 
So I'm going to hot air the paste, try to get it all as much on the chip as possible. All right, and then we're going to run our iron over everything to try to clean off any excess stuff. Now there's these little capacitors that are under the CPU. You can take those off. You don't need them for data recovery. For long-term repair, probably. Uh, but I don't recommend these jobs for long-term repair. A lot of times they're very unstable. Uh, and they only, they typically only last for uh, a few days. I sent stuff back in working condition and then they say it died after. So it's not a, now some people do offer this as a full repair. I don't trust it. So just from my experience, I don't do this for repair. So if you're got this far and you're wondering, I'm not, I will not do this for repair. I mean, if you got this far into the video, because you want to repair it, you don't have any important data on there, but you want to repair it, I'm sorry, <laughs> find someone else. I'm not going to do it. So now I've got to clean up the rest of the underfill that's on this. There's a lot, pretty much the whole chip underneath is coated in this stuff. All right, so this is uh this is a very delicate process, so don't just assume Oh, I'm just easily scraping it. There's a certain amount of pressure you have to do to scrape all this stuff off. If you do it uh, too rough, then you can damage the chip. Once you damage the chip, it's game over. So don't take this. Uh... You know, a lot of people say, oh, you make it look easy. I'm like, well, yeah, because I've been doing this for so long. That's kind of how it works. Once you have a lot of experience doing something, you can do it. Uh, almost uh without thinking about it but it took me many years to get to where i am so don't uh don't assume i just uh, woke up one day and i was able to do these i had to practice on a lot of boards i have a huge uh junkyard or graveyard of dead boards because i've practiced and practiced try to the key is really when you're practicing, pay attention to what you're doing, what's going wrong. Uh, try to catch any mistakes you do and learn from them. I don't think there's any other way to really learn this. One thing I notice is a lot of people ask, oh, what temperatures are you using? And I think that's the wrong mindset to have. If you think the only thing you're missing is the temperatures, then you're not ready. The key is really learning how to um learn from yourself based on previous repair attempts or previous practice runs and you should be able to learn figure out what temperature is needed yourself uh you should be able to lift the chip obviously you know you could use my video as reference to see how long it took me to remove the chip versus how, how long it took you but and you could obviously see my temperatures which you could also use as a reference point but if you think you just need to know what, what is the right temperature or like what is the right stencil, I think you're, you're not ready. Now, at a certain point, when you get to a certain uh, skill level, you'll, you'll learn, like pretty much everything's universal and you'll be able to learn off yourself just trying stuff. You don't need to ask specifics like what temperature and stuff. All right, so there's a few oxidized pads, so I'm just gonna gently scrape them and expose them. A lot of times they'll look like rip pads, but they're not. This oxidation that got in on the 
on the pad. So it's just like burnt oxygen, I guess. Now, a lot of times you can just reball right over them, but not always. So, if we could just scratch them out just a little bit, that's enough for the solder and flux to kind of take over and fill in the pad. All right, so now let's uh, wick this flat. Like I said, I'll link to all my tools and supplies and everything in the video description. If I leave something out, just let me know in the comments and then I'll update it. I typically I'm pretty good at um, noting every tool, at least all the common ones, or at least all the ones that are specific to this video. Okay. You now some stuff, I always try to prioritize a US seller. So whether it's Mobile Centrix, uh, Indoor Gadgets, you know, eBay or uh, Amazon. But uh, otherwise, if I can't find them through there, then I'm gonna link to Usually AliExpress or DIY fix tool, because if you can't find them in the US, then the only option is China. And there you go. CPU is prepped for reball. Uh, let's prep the rest of the chips. I'm gonna put the chip in the dirty part of the towel. As you can see, it's pretty dirty. Actually, let me dump this in my trash can. All right, so basically I, I held this over my trash can and kind of wiped the paper towel. Uh, that way I can kind of dump all the all the chunks of stuff that was sitting on top. I could dump it into the trash can. All right, so same thing. Prep this chip. Now this one is a lot easier to prep because there's not that many pads. And majority of the pads are ground or NC. And tend to be oxidized. So I'm just feeding a solder. This is uh, my 183 regular soldering stuff, the 6337 solder wire. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wick, wick this flat and leave it as is. With the reball, it'll clean up any of the oxidized pads. Yeah, so that chunk up there, when I wipe it down, it'll wipe it into the trash can, it'll uh, get rid of it. So I'm slicing off the excess that's on the edges of the chip. This is important because when you go to try to place the chip, uh, you will likely kind of get in the way. Yeah, so you gotta make sure you clean up really well. All right, so I think this one should be good to reball. And lastly is the RAM. This is the one that sits on top of the CPU. You know what, let me uh, put a little more low melt solder paste on here. It's kind of like, uh, this paste it would have been trash anyway. It's, it's uh, one day old, so I don't, if it's one day old, I don't reuse it for sandwich ray balls. So might as well put it to use over here. Another thing you can do is just put your soldering iron directly into the paste. So here, let me show you. you rub the paste off your tools.
This one seems to have very little underfill on it. Actually, it looked like I had more, but I guess not. Now, question is, how long can I make this? How short can I make this video? Oh, there's some underfill on the edges there. I can feel it. And I hate this underfill because it's very stinky and very uh, messy. Like, it just, I don't know. It's, <laughs> if you ever have to work with this, you'll see what I mean. It's very uh, not pleasant to work with. I guess is the best way to describe it. Now I'm just cleaning with the, another clean cloth. And what I'm going to do is clean off the sides. Clean off the chunks of solder that might be on the chip somewhere. And then let's clean off this little chunk of underfill that's on the edge. Now take a look how the texture of it, it's very gummy. It's very, really hard to clean. Luckily with the knife tip it works well, but in this spot right here, might as well just like do a little spot treatment with my blade to clean off those chunks. And because it's clear, it's kind of hard to see sometimes. So you, you might get it on your chip when you're trying to install it, and then and then wonder why the chip is sitting weird and not soldering on. Those few oxidized pads here, I'm just scraping out a little bit of the surface. Uh, there's one right here. A little more underfill here. Now the nice thing about Samsung or just Android CPU swaps in general is the chips are a lot more durable meaning it's a lot harder to rip pads although it is possible it just a little uh, I don't know the the structural setup of these are way way uh, less fragile. Alright, so first thing I'm going to do is we're going to reball the UFS. This is the storage and we're going to check the health. Make sure the chip is not dead. And I'm using a Bumblebee stencil uh, for the S10 series. So all S10, S10e, S10 Plus uh, models use the same chips. Oh man, this paste is kind of old. So it might not be the best for your ball, but let's see. Let's get some shiny solder balls. Link to the t-shirt in the video description. All right, so this is pretty easy to reball. Let's see if, uh, there's a lot of oxidized pads. So let's see if the solder balls, the shiny solder balls form nicely. Oh, maybe I see a lot of uh, a lot of gaps there. All right, so I'm gonna shift it over. Here's a trick: if the solder balls are all there, they're just not sticking to the chip. Add some flux. And then try again. Try to get the flux to flow on all the pads, or at least on most of them, and then spot treat the the few that are left behind at the very end. After, all right, there it goes. A lot of them are cooperating now. 
Oh, it looks like they all did. There you go. A little bit of flux goes a long way. All right, let's poke this through. All right, so here's the chip. Uh, as far as I can tell, it looks even. So let's clean it up and pop it into my programmer. The JCU15, I think it's called. All right, so here's the programmer. I'm gonna pop the chip in here. If you guys want more specifics on this programmer, I have a separate video on that. So uh, check it out. Uh, this cable plugs into power. And then the bottom side, you plug into the PC. So we have power and PC. And then the program is a JC Repair Assistant software and it'll automatically detect and it looks like it's reading the data. Uh, actually, you can see here, there's a 30 to 40% uh, device life time use, but that's fine as, it, as long as it doesn't give errors. Uh, it says normal, Concern, consume less than 80% of what, blah, blah, blah. Um, in other words, the chip is good. If it was bad, it would say uh, hard disk not detected. Right here it says hard disk info. Uh, if it was bad, it would just not read it, give errors, or this thing will beep at you and just have a red light. Right now it has green and stuff, so, so we're good. So let's uh, close this out and continue on. All right, so now let's reball the CPU. I'm going with CPU next because uh, I haven't prepped the low melt that we're gonna use on the RAM. Now, I probably need more paste. So you know what, let's do that first. Let's prep this one. <laughs> I actually find the CPU a lot easier to reboot than the RAM. So this is a uh, mechanic 183 temperature XG50. I use this for for everything except for sandwich reballs. That's when I use the other paste, which I'll show you here in a second. And then we want to dry it out a little bit. All right. So if we match up the Pencil. And there we go. Put your fingers very wide. If you put them too close, you're gonna bend the stencil and it won't get on there. And then we just apply it with the dried out paste. This should be very easy to make some shiny solder bulbs. If you guys are enjoying the video and don't know what to comment, uh, Sunny solder balls is a good comment. It also proves you are you've made it this far into the video. So, also as I'm reballing, I want you guys to rate the reball uh, results. And by the way, I'm assuming most people watching this are probably repair shops, so we do offer B2B pricing for this. Uh, so if you're a repair shop and want to outsource uh, these data recovery jobs, we we'll offer a big discount compared to what we quote customers. And I saw one spot down here did not have enough paste. So in other words, uh, whatever price I give you, you'll still be able to mark it up and still be lower than what the customer and customer gets quoted. So just keep that in mind. Um, that way I'm not undercutting you and you have basically the benefit is, uh, you know, you handle the customer, I do the work and then you get the, the good review and I make the money. So yeah, you're not going to make as much as me, but you at least, uh, keep the customer in house. Uh, you offer them the solution. Even if you subcontract it out to us, uh, you, you're still the face to the customer that, you know, recovered their data. So, you know, maybe you can't do the data recovery in-house, but later in the future scenarios where they broke their screen, you can handle that or the battery, or if they have a, you know, a 
brother or cousin or someone who needs a repair, they'll still remember you versus coming to me, paying more, and then they like my service and then I keep them as a customer. So that's just something to consider. All right, so these didn't solder on that well. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do like the last one. Try to apply some flux. But yeah, that just, uh, you know, some benefits to B2B is if you outsource it, you don't give the customer a chance to find a new repair shop who can do stuff. Most customers, the only downside to outsourcing is obviously turnaround time, uh, but if you are a good salesman, that shouldn't be a problem. Now, if you want to learn sales techniques, uh, definitely there's millions of uh, marketing and sales guys online you could learn from. I feel like that's the biggest uh, thing people, repair shops, uh, suffer with is say, like, not sales, like how many devices, how much stuff they're selling in their store, but actual the technique and the science behind selling a service to a customer a lot of people lack that skill it seems like you gotta teach you gotta learn how to show the customer value that you're offering all right what i'm doing now is shaving down the pads because i feel like a lot of them are not shaved down they're like uneven and it gives me an opportunity to add more solder paste So I'm just scraping off the rest, wiping it down one more time. And then heat it one more time. So basically the paste on top of the reball will help solidify the actual reball. So here in a few seconds, we'll have some shiny solder balls. Oh, that. Let's go slowly and surely these will all fill in nicely. And zoom all the way in. All right, give it a few seconds to cool down and poke it through. Take a look at that. Now, depending on your pace, you might have a bunch of flat uh, specks of paste in there. Just reflow it one more time without adding any flux or anything. Just reheat it like this. And those were all kind of will melt away. And it shouldn't be an issue. Another thing I do recommend is after you reflow it, add more flux. This allows for the chip to be prepped for install. So basically just flow the flux over the whole chip, all the pads, use gravity to help you spread it evenly. Once every pad is coated with flux, we flow it one more time and make sure all those balls become shiny. Sorry there, it's getting blurry because of the height difference. So you can see, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's very even. But yeah, this is ready as well. Now if you did, Add a lot of flux, it might overflow to the back. So you can do is rub the back. Here, let me reflow it. I think it cooled down. Let me heat it up again. 
And while it's hot, rub the back and you'll see you'll get flux. See that yellow stain right there? That's the flux that overflowed to the back. That way when you lay it on your work mat, it's not going to stick. Alright, lastly is the ram. But first, let me clean this one. Good news about this CPU swap is I don't have to prep the board. That that process is very time consuming and very uh I hate it. <laughs> it's just a lot of underfed to clean off. You have to leave it very clean. So this is the paste, the real life X solder paste for the RAM, and you'll see why in a bit why I use a different paste for the RAM. So scoop some up and then you're gonna dry it out. Same way, just press it into a clean cloth. Yes, you will get lint on there, but it's fine. Nothing, nothing bad will happen with the lint. It'll just burn away. Okay, so the reason why I say I have trouble with the RAM is just because I have to use this paste. And this paste is not the best for reballing. Alright, so I applied it. Now we're going to scrape it. And then I'm going to wipe it. You always want to wipe it because it gets rid of the extra debris that's on top and it compresses the paste into the square where it belongs. And then, I know I'm a little off angle. Let me see if I can adjust that. Ooh, I don't know if I messed that up, but <laughs> let's see. All right, let's uh, make some more shiny solder balls. Link in the video description. All right, actually that looks pretty good, I think. Guess we'll see once we separate it. Now, because this is low melts, you have to wait a lot longer for it to cool down to lift the stencil. So you gotta monitor the solder balls and wait till they change texture and then you gotta get it out of the stencil without losing any of the solder balls because uh low melt is so brittle yeah see there's one so brittle like it doesn't stay solid like it's not a solid connection to the board there's one missing here that's still my stencil all right, well, I think I lost it. These are not it. These are excess paste. All right, so now we got to fix this. See what I mean? The other two were so easy, and this one is a, was a mess. All right, so let's reflow this. Make sure all the solder balls go into their uh, assigned position. Let's look at that missing solder ball there. Now if I want to reball this after taking out a stencil, I typically will just clean it, clean off all the flux. Now it could be that solder pad isn't even needed. It could be a ground or something. But you never know. There's no way to know. There's no schematics or anything for this. So what I'm going to do is add a little bit of flux right to the pad. Let's throw this back on here. And before I do that, let's clean up the old flux from this one from the stencil. 
One, uh, another way, another layer of clean is to shave off, kind of just run your blade over it. Because it could be chunks of crap uh, stuck on your stencil. Alright, here's the ship. All right, here's the pad. And we just need that one solder ball. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna apply paste just in that area. And the rest, I'm gonna shave down as well. I'm gonna reball that one more time. Hopefully this time we get it. And it looks like we still did it. That's a stubborn solder ball. Right, let me add some more flux. Just hold the stencil here so it's like really close and I think I finally got it pressing down the stencil made the solder ball kind of get closer over the center of the pad I gotta wait for this to cool down so I think it uh, made more contact with it All right, let's reflow this one more time. We get rid of all the random paste debris. Add flux while it's hot. Fly one more time and helps to get flux on every single point but also careful with your flux itself it could be dirty you could be embedding a piece of dirt on there and then it uh, messes up your whole your whole job if you get a little speck of dirt and you try to install a chip and I have to basically reball everything all over again, all three chips. Well, technically, you just if you get it on the CPU or RAM, you just have to do those two. But still, it's not fun. So that's what you always want to inspect. Visually inspect everything, make sure it's good and clean. Yeah, all uh, three chips are ready to go. So this is the donor board. This is my known good S10 board. I've used it several times. Yes, there are some missing pads, but those are not important. All right, so here are the three chips we're gonna install. Uh, they're all prepped and ready to go. So I like to leave the UFS for last. So first is the CPU. What I like to do is preheat the board a little bit. Because I need to add some flux, but I want to add a thin layer of flux. The CPU already has some flux on there too. All right, so. So I just put little dots of flux. Also, I want to get some on the corners. I want to see the flux uh, coming out the edges. Now, the orientation will have to match. I actually have a marker here already. So, let's find that arrow. 
Oh, right here. So this arrow goes to here, at least on the S10 Plus. It might vary on your model. Actually, is it lined up good? Now I do see the top of the CPU is a little messed up, so let me add a little bit of flux there. I might fix it. And then using low hot air and airflow, 330 and 25. We're gonna heat it for a pretty long time, uh, and then we'll bump it up when necessary. So I have it, I feel like it's aligned pretty good. I can see the orient, the arrow right there is like perfectly, well maybe off by like one millimeter. So that's fine, it'll snap into place. And then the big nozzle helps apply heat evenly across the most of the chip. I feel like there's something here on the top of the CPU, but we'll save that for later. So I'm trying to heat from different angles. The goal is to apply flux and let the flux heat and spread out as it gets hot. That's what it does. If it's not spreading out, then it's not hot enough. But careful, get it, get the nozzle real close, but don't touch the nozzle onto the board. Oh, I see the flux coming out. Right here at the bottom, see that little liquid. All right, let me see, can I bump this? Look at that, it's installed. All right, so I'm gonna give it a few seconds. I'm gonna see if I could wake off this solder over here. This is low melt that's on here, so it should wake up pretty easy. Using hot air and gentle rubbing with the wick. Also, that doesn't seem like anything. You know, that flux looks a little too burnt for my taste, so I'm gonna try to wipe it down a little bit. All right, now it's fresh paste, I mean flux. That's kind of a lot. Well, let's do it anyway. And then the arrow goes in the same place. So top right in this orientation. I mean, if you don't, if you don't understand the orientation, you probably shouldn't be trying this, to be honest. All right, so these stack up directly on top of each other. On this model is, is literally right over each other. On some models, the CPU is a little bigger than the RAM, so it might be uh, slightly uh, different. So make sure you guys are paying attention to all the little details like this because some people don't and then ruin phones. That's uh, one of the keys to being successful in this field is paying attention to all the little details and being uh, aware of, of all that stuff. I think this has already installed. I'm gonna bump the top layer. Yep. All right, and then the UFS. I'll just put a little bit of flux. Now I push some to the edges. I want to see that um, bubble kind of come out. And UFS has an orientation dot in the pads. So that goes like this. 
And I have a marker here too, as a backup. All right, now let's heat this one. So this one's gonna take a while. The chip is like way thicker. Even though it has less pads, it's like way thicker as far as uh, thermal mass, I think. Also, the pads are mostly on the center, so I'm like focusing my hot air there. Small little circles. Oh, I see the chip moving into position. I'm going to bump it. I'm gonna find a good spot and rotate it. Yeah, it's, it's installed. All right, so now let's give it a one, two minute break and then everything cool down so we can test. All right, so it's been a little bit. Let's cool it down further with some ISO and some compressed air. And by compressed, I mean my little hand duster. I'm compressing it to blow the air out. Okay, let's uh, inspect. And as far as I can tell, Alright, we can see the shiny solder balls are all lined up. Uh, nothing looks too funky. Oh, I'm actually surprised I could kind of see the solder balls under the UFS. Alright, so let's give this a try. Alright, so if you remember in the beginning of the video what this was doing, now let's see what it does after the CPU swap. We swapped over CPU, RAM, and UFS. All right, no short. All right, zero amps before prompt to boots. All right, this is gonna be a big moment. Prompt to boots. That looks like a good boot consumption. Yeah, see how before it was like, bouncing around like 100s, maybe 200s, and then go back to zero, and then it'll just like go crazy. This is a uh, healthy boot consumption. So let's put it into my known good housing and test it further. It's funny because S10 Plus looks also like a slot, like a slot machine here in Vegas, where, we're, where we are located. So if you want to mail in your device for data recovery, we are in Las Vegas. If you want to send it to someone who has a high success rate for data recovery, we are, we are the ones. I don't know many, I don't know that many people in the US who can do this successfully at a high degree. All right, so because boot consumption looks normal, I'm gonna do the charging uh, now. So we have, oh, charging logo, five volts, 1.39 amps. Uh, oh, we got nine volts. We get the charging symbol with the number. I think we're good, there you go. This is working. Now let's prompt to boot, the power button. You know, we're still not in the clear. It has to boot, unlock, and work. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, it's not gonna do anything. All right, I got the unlock code here on my, next to me. 
These are really exciting. By the way, if you want to support the channel, I do have a coffee mug as well in my merch store, so check that out. Link in the video description. All right, so still charging up. Oh, let's see if it's going to work. Oh, carrier logo. That's always a good sign. We should get the lock screen here in just a second. Now for data recovery uh, for Samsung's, oh look at that. We have touch and we're unlocked. So for data recovery on Samsung's, what we do is, what we recommend is a smart switch backup. This is the easiest way to recover data uh, out of a phone and to load it into a new Samsung phone. So let me show you the smart switch backup process as well. We're gonna go to settings. Then we're gonna scroll down to, well first, uh, I need to check something. We're gonna go to battery and device care storage basically, and we're gonna check. All right, so this customer has approximately 12 gigs of pictures, uh, five gigs of videos, and not much other than that. So I would say a 64 gig drive would work. So we go to settings. Uh, we scroll down to smart switch. I oh, was right here, accounts and backup. Right here, it says smart switch, click that. And then you wanna do exter external storage transfer. Click on that. Uh, if you never used it before, then it's gonna ask you to approve, Just allow. Now here's where you have to plug in a device, an external storage device, so like a USB-C uh, drive, this is uh, the ones I include with all my Samsung smart switch data recoveries. Uh, I confirmed this phone does have less than 64 gigs. So I'm going to use a hub because I want to be able to charge this while it's backing up. So this uh, USB-C hub has USB-A ports and USB-C ports including a USB-C in for charging. So I'm going to plug in the charger into the USB-C in. So now it's charging. I'm gonna plug in the USB drive here. And then it's gonna detect here in a second. There you go, USB storage. And this will also charge at a fast rate. So it's doing uh, nine volts, uh, one amp, so about nine watts. And yeah, look at that, 41 gigs of data. So you can do everything or custom. You do custom, you can, uh, pick exactly what you want so you know if you want to just get certain things like I had a customer recently who just wanted all their contacts and text but they did not want all the pictures so you could just select those on here and then restore so let me back up I'm gonna do everything next and also how many texts do you want do you want all of them to so click all transfer back up now and you're set. When this is done, the data will be backed up into this USB. We also copy, uh, we keep a copy on our computers as a fail safe. So in case we ship this back to you and it gets lost, we at least have the USB with your data, uh, a copy on our end, so that we can just resend you the USB. And because all the packages come with $100 of insurance included, uh, even if you don't choose, you opt to get insurance, uh, there's still $100 there, so we'll use that money to pay for a new USB and shipping and get you a new USB and get that sorted out. So the safest way to get you your data uh, is to uh, USB and then we keep a copy on our end. And then once you confirm that you've loaded your data onto your new phone and everything's good, we delete it on our end and then it's uh, the job is done. So in this case, once the data is copied on here, what you do on your new phone, you plug it in, you go to the same smart switch setting, external data transfer, and then you pick the, it'll give you an option. There's a backup uh, in that USB, it'll tell you. Uh, it'll be like your device name, whatever, and then how much data is there. You click on that, and then you select all the data you want to restore, and just follow the on-screen uh, messages, and you're done. Now, uh, another, one thing I just learned is, if you try to use your phone right away, you'll notice the data is not there yet. It still has to process, even after loading the the data first, it still has to go through all the data and sort it for you. So it does take some time, but just be patient and you'll be done. So there you have it. That is how you recover data from a, a tech damaged 
uh, S10 Plus and we transfer it to a working motherboard. Now this phone also, another thing is we're not gonna ship you the phone back in working condition. We're gonna pull the chips back off and basically wick it flat so it's ready for the next job. Fortunately, it'd be way too much uh, work to do this every single time. That's why we have a donor here set. But uh, we at least got your data. We'll send you the chips off the board because at that point it doesn't really matter. And you could, you could keep them just in case for whatever reason, you, there was something that was missed. We at least have your chips so we can redo it. If that worst comes to worst, uh, or you know, whatever. So that is how we recover data from an S10. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you guys are smashing the like button and subscribing. I have a ton of videos on repairs, data recovery, and other uh, repair shop related stuff. Make sure you guys are checking out the links down below in the video description. Get yourself one of these t-shirts to support my channel. You know, the time I spend on making these videos is a lot. So really appreciate everyone who's purchased a t-shirt so far, signing up to my locust community, you know, sharing my videos. I, re I really appreciate everyone who is supporting the channel. So uh, make sure you guys comment down below what you guys learned from this video. I will link to another CPU swap video down below me and uh, I'll see you guys in the next one.